Here, I, I think this is the last bit of histology, last bit of anatomy that we need to look at in the eye, and it's the retina. It's an absolutely beautifully organized piece of anatomy. Um, you'll love it. it. It looks really complicated. Um, it doesn't have to be. Um, it's not as complicated as it looks. We'll have a look at the retina, we'll explain the layers of the cells, we'll explain exactly what's going on there, and you'll better understand how the eye works, all right? Uh, so in previous weeks, we have looked at the eye as a whole. So we've looked at the connective tissues, the sclera, the tough layer on the outside. We've looked at the choroid, which is where we see a lot of the blood vessels. And we've looked at the structures of the anterior eye, the lens, the cornea, the ciliary body, um, the iris, all of those bits and bobs. So this should actually be a little bit simpler because we've only got one area to look at. Okay. Um, I have been talking an awful lot today because we've got exams coming up, so I've been very popular. So let me try and take this slowly. <laughs> my brain can keep up with my mouth, maybe. Um, there we go, look at that. So here we are at the posterior part of the eyeball. Those layers we're looking at there are the sclera, which is the connective tissue layer, the choroid, lots of pigment in there, lots of blood vessels, and then the stripes next to that, those are the neurons of the, uh, of the retina, of the retinal layer, the light detecting layer. If I slide up, ooh, that looks quite different. That's the optic nerve. Um, if you want me to slide, let's say the optic nerve, if I slide all the way to the other side, look, there's the lens, go through the pupil, there's the cornea, so these are all things that we've been looking at over the last few weeks, but now we are literally focusing on this. So let's uh, let's jump up. So that's that's at with my four times objective lens, ten times to my eyes, forty times magnification for me. So this is now a hundred times magnification to my eye. Um, for you, it will depend a little bit on the, on the size of your screen. Look at that order. Isn't that something? So what we should do is um, we'll work our way through the layers. Now we're going to talk about inner and outer layers or external and internal layers. Um, we're going to think about the eyeball as a whole. So if it's an outer layer, that layer is closer to the outside of the eyeball, so closer to the sclera. If it's an inner layer, it's closer to the, the space there where we see the white on the left. It's closer to the innermost part of the eye. Does that make sense? Outer, closer to the outer part of the eyeball. Inner, closer to the innermost part of the eyeball. Sounds obvious, gets confusing. Um, now, if we look at that choroid layer, we can see lots of pigment in there, and we can see uh, lots of blood vessels. So this is, a, this is the vascular layer of the eye. Um, if I go up to a higher magnification, so now we're looking at um, two, I'm looking at 200 times magnification. The layer of the choroid up against the retinal layer is the choriocapillary layer, and in there we've got capillaries. What a surprise. And these capillaries are supplying blood to the cells in the adjacent layers of the retina. Cells in the adjacent layers of the retina. Well, we've got a layer of retinal pigmented epithelium, and then we've got the rods and the cones. And there is a, um, there is a, a blood retina barrier here, like the blood brain barrier only certain molecules are allowed to pass. They're not like leaky capillaries we see elsewhere in the body. So a blood retina barrier. So the choriocapillary layer is the layer up against that thin line of pigment. And like I say, that's the pigmented epithelium, the RPE, the retinal pigmented epithelium. And then the layer next to that, that's the photoreceptor layer. That's where we've got the rods and the cones. And we can, we can see rods and cones. 
the rods are more rod shaped and the cones are a bit cone shaped. Would you like me to go to a higher power just to uh, see if I can point that out? This isn't my favourite objective lens, this, but it does okay. Can you see there? So we've got some fatter, denser cells and we've got some stripier cells. Um, so these are the rods and the cones. These are the photoreceptor cells, but that's part of the neuron. Let me bump back out again so we can see the other layers. Um, that's funny, isn't it? Is that the light is coming from the left side and it's passing through all those other layers of cells before they get to the rods and cones, the photoreceptor layers. Uh, but the photoreceptor layers are up against that pigmented epithelium. So the photoreceptor cells are going to produce action potentials because of reactions with light. And the pigment means that the light doesn't go into the photoreceptor layer and then bounce back out again and go through the photoreceptor layer again. It stops light bouncing around inside the eye. Um, so that RPE, the retinal pigmented epithelium, which is a simple epithelium, so by pigment, we're talking about melanocytes making melanin. That layer is up against the rods and the cones. OK, so what about rods and cones then? Rods then are um, cells that are very sensitive to light. So sensitive to low levels of light. These are cells that are good for seeing when there's not much light in low levels of light. Um, these cells um, produce and contain rhodopsin and um, rhodopsin, when it interacts with light, it changes shape which triggers a series of signals which cause hyperpolarization of the rod because it's a neuron which causes a neurotransmitter release onto other neurons which we'll look at and talk about which then those action potentials travel to your brain and you perceive vision, light on some of these cells. Um, there are far more rods than cones in the eye. The rods tend to be more peripherally, relate, peripherally arranged, so they make up very much of your peripheral vision. And that production of rhodopsin, well, um, so in bright light, um, rhodopsin gets photo bleached. Um, when you're in a low light environment, it takes a while for the cells to produce enough rhodopsin for this to work properly. It can take 20, 10, uh, can take 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and once the rhodopsin has been used by changing shape, it needs to be regenerated again. So that's one of the reasons why your eyes adapt to light. Your cells are, are, are regenerating rhodopsin so that the cells can react to those low levels of light that because they're like I say they're very sensitive cells. Um, a component of rhodopsin is uh, vitamin A. So rod cells detect a certain wavelength of light and they're very sensitive to it but they don't really detect colour, they don't really perceive colour with the rods which is why in low light everything's a bit black and white. The cone cells um, detect colour. The cone cells have opsin proteins and you have humans have three different opsin proteins um, for red, green and blue. So these opsins also then react with light of a certain wavelength to get the, neuro to get the cell to produce a, an action potential. So we have three opsins so um, with slightly overlapping wavelengths and different cells have different opsins and we have fewer cones than we have rods and the cones aren't as sensitive to light, they, they work better in bright light um, but then, <clears throat> uh, and they tend to be more centrally arranged in the retina but then you put all that together and you can see a wide range of colours because you can see mixtures of reds and greens and blues, right? Um, some animals have different opsins. For example, bees can see um, ultraviolet light, but they can't see red light, so plants look quite different to them. Some birds and fish have four opsins, so they, they can see different wavelengths and they overlap in different ways. 
Um, so, um, yeah, the cones are a little bit shorter, a little bit fatter, a little bit cone-shaped, and um, detect colour. Now, probably going to need a little bit of imagination. Um, so, the other layers that we can see there in the retinal layer, these are neurons and nuclei and anyway we'll get to that but there are also glial cells in here so this is neural tissue neural tissue has glial cells support cells and the glial cells in here are Muller Muller cells and we can see um, a membrane a line between the photoreceptor layer where we see all the rods and cones and the next layer where we see lots of lovely purple dots which are the nuclei of cells so that that um, external limiting layer or outer limiting layer is the membrane and all of those nuclei that we see there, that next layer, those are just the cell bodies of the rods and the cones. So the cell bodies are in this lovely layer and then they've sent their cells, the photoreceptive parts of their cells, into the photoreceptive layer. Can you imagine that? Cell body and then, so that's the shape of the cell, right? Next to the layer of all of those nuclei, we can see another layer. And does that look like maybe cytoplasmic processes in there? It looks a bit nervy. So this is the outer plexiform layer. And what we're seeing in there is we are seeing um, processes of the photoreceptor cells, processes of the rods and cones, synapsing with processes of intermediate neurons, bipolar neurons and horizontal neurons, which are going to carry the action potentials that have been generated by the photoreceptor cells onwards. So if that outer plexiform layer has the processes of horizontal cells and bipolar cells, those intermediate neurons, then the next layer that we see, where we see those nuclei, well, those are the nuclei, the cell bodies of the bipolar and the horizontal cells. Um, so that's the inner nuclear layer. Remember, I was talking about outer and inner. So the outer nuclear layer is closer to the pigmented layer, the outer surface of the eyeball. The inner nuclear layer is closer to the center of the eyeball. Um, and then we see... Um, Another layer next to that, um, another plexiform layer, so the inner plexiform layer. So this looks like, looks a bit nervousy. There we've got processes of neurons and synapses, and these are the bipolar cells taking the action potentials from the photoreceptor cells to the ganglion cells. We've also got synapses between amacrine cells. We'll come back to those later. So if that's the inner plexiform layer next to the inner nuclear layer, then the layer in again is the ganglion cell layer. And it's the ganglion cell layer. We can see the cell bodies there. It's the ganglion cells. They are going to collect those action potentials and they are going to send them through their axons and their axons will become the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the optic tract. Um, that also run to the, the midbrain and other bits and bobs. But it's these cells that are finally collect, connect, collecting those photoreceptors and taking them to the brain. So can you see the next layer, the layer closest to the middle of the eyeball, next to the ganglion cells? So that's the um, inner limiting membrane. So isn't that funny? Light is collected by the cells closest to the choroid, the action potentials are carried back out, and then those axons are actually kind of on like the inside surface of the retina, carrying the action potentials back to the optic nerve. Now look, if we, if we go up, that layer will get thicker as we get closer to the optic nerve, because it's collecting more and more axons, right? So as we, as we get, oh look, it's getting thicker and thicker because we're getting more and more axons from more and more of the retina and they're converging and here we go, we're at the optic nerve. Let's pop up to a lower power so we can see more of it. Um, 
So there's the optic nerve. And what strikes you about uh, the optic nerve? I mean, that's where all the axons are going now, and now it becomes a myelinated nerve, carries all those action potentials into the, into the cranial cavity and towards the brain. But what's different? Uh, well, we, we've lost all of those layers. There's no retina. There are no retinal cells here. This is what we're looking at here is the optic disc, where the optic nerve leaves the retina. Um, there's no choroid layer, there's no retinal layer, which means this is a blind spot. There are no photoreceptors here. Um, so this is what we mean when we refer to the blind spot in the eye. You've got one in each eye, and the way your brain perceives the world and makes an image means you never notice this blind spot. It, it, it cancels it out. There are also blood vessels in the nerve fibre layer. Um, so the layers of the retina on that side So the layers on the retina uh, on the innermost side will get uh, blood supply to them from that layer, whereas the, um, the layers closest to the choroid will get their blood supply to them by the, the choroid, chorocapillary layer, choriocapillary layer. Um, now the other thing that we would usually look for in the retina would be um, the fovea, the macula lutea, the fovealis. So the macula lutea refers to a yellow patch, and the fovea and the fovealis are regions of the retina where you don't have any rods, you just have lots and lots of cones, slightly smaller cones than normal, packed together really, really tightly, and that gives you your very high definition colour vision that you actually look at things with. But of course, because the retina, the eyeball, is a sphere, depending upon our plane of section through that sphere, um, that'll determine whether we have it or not, and we, and we don't, we don't see it. But um, it would look a little bit different. I think you lose the ganglion cell layer as well. So we don't see the, the fovea here. Ooh, some uh, more nerves there. Anywho, so those are the layers of the retina. So you've seen the, um, the names of the layers. All the layers have got names, but I think to summarize, um, the layer closest to the pigment is the photoreceptor layer with the rods and cones, so light passes through all the other layers to get to the photoreceptor layer. Proteins react to that light, trigger action potentials in the photoreceptor cells, the rods and the cones, and we see the cell bodies of the rods and the cones in the nuclei next to them. Those action potentials are passed to intermediate cells, horizontal cells and bipolar cells, uh, which we see in that other layer of uh, nuclei. And then those intermediate cells, particularly the bipolar cells, carry those action potentials to the ganglion cells, and then the ganglion cells send those action potentials through their processes, and their processes are the optic nerve, the optic tract, and what have you. Uh, and that goes as far as the lateral geniculate nucleus and the thalamus, and from there, optic radiations carry those action potentials to the visual cortex in the brain, and we perceive the world, and that is vision. Pretty, uh, pretty nice, huh? So what we're looking at here is the layers are, I mean, this shows how this is uh, both evolved and developed in the embryo, but we're looking at circuits. Those amacrine cells that I was talking about earlier, they're inhibitory cells. There are lots of interesting, clever things going on here about how these action potentials... Circuits are formed that affect vision. Vision is so complex. All right, let's stick with what we've got here and just add the idea that the amacrine cells modify the outputs from the photoreceptor cells. But there we go. We have looked at the histology of the eye. Well done, us. Um, and as this is my last histology video, because I think I've covered everything now, the one thing I haven't covered are structures in the ear, but I haven't got any, um, haven't got any slides yet. If I get a, a slide of inner ear structures, I'll do a, a video on that. But otherwise, I think I'll be going back to the lab. I've got a few ideas for topics. All right. I hope that was interesting. I think it's interesting. I'll, uh, I'll see you next week.